I have a whole criminal record. I could never run, I could never run for president. <laughs> I don't like the word tolerance. Книги, которые мы читаем, музыка, которую мы слушаем, кино, которое мы любим, и одежда, которую мы носим. Вот кто все это создает? The stories of gay wives that nobody was telling. Как живут эти люди? Кого они любят? Как они делают то, что мы так любим читать, слушать, носить и смотреть? They have both died. Not because I was gay. Есть миллион ток-шоу и YouTube каналов, в которых селебы дают интервью. С ними все в порядке. Это замечательные программы. Пока в кадре находятся гетеросексуальные гости. Gay, 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 gay. Стоит там появиться лесбиянке, гею или бисексуалу, ведущий сразу делает вид, что у них вообще нет никакой личной жизни. Что они ни с кем не спят. Их личная жизнь — это их личное дело. В итоге мы ничего не знаем про тех, кто создает то, что мы смотрим, слушаем, читаем и любим. В общем, вы смотрите первое русское шоу, в котором мы не делаем вид, что личная жизнь наших героев не имеет значения. Имеет и еще какое. Но это шоу не про то, кто с кем спит. Это шоу про выдающихся людей. Гениальных музыкантов, писателей, художников, дизайнеров, спортсменов. И про то, как их личная жизнь влияет на их творчество, на их идеи и на их успех. С языка снял. Женские истории? Конечно. Окей. Мы приехали в Нью-Йорк, чтобы поговорить с Майклом Каннингемом. Каннингем один из самых популярных в России современных американских писателей. Он стал известен благодаря роману «Дом на краю света». Это история про двух молодых парней из маленького города, которые когда-то в школе как будто бы влюбляются друг в друга, потом они встречаются в Нью-Йорке, и здесь у них случается роман втроем с их подругой. В общем, такая сложная и непонятная история э, любви, в которой люди пытаются быть счастливыми, и у них это, в общем, не очень-то получается. Но по-настоящему большую всемирную славу Каннингем получил благодаря роману «Часы» и благодаря фильму, снятому по этому роману. В фильме по этой книге снялись сразу три большие голливудские звезды. Это Мэрил Стрип, Джулиана Мур и Николь Кидман, которая получила Оскар за лучшую женскую роль. When was the point when you realized that you are really famous, internationally acknowledged American writer? I, I hope this won't sound falsely modest. I, I still don't feel like I'm in some big deal of famous writer. I Please. Don't. Well, I know, I know, I know, I know. <clears throat> It really wasn't until the hours that things started to really change, and suddenly I was being invited to other countries and um, giving readings in big halls, and, and that was really the hours. So, uh, the hours. One of the characters, Clarissa, she goes mm -hmm. out for the flowers, mm -hmm. and she meets Hollywood star on the street. Yes. Who resembles uh, Meryl Streep? Right, right. Later in the film, Meryl Streep appears as the main character. And was it a kind of a joke from producer, or is it just a coincidence? It was. It was a coincidence. Um, in the book, Marissa sees a, a, a film crew filming on the streets in, in New York, and she sees a movie star. Maybe it's. Meryl Streep, maybe it's Vanessa Redgrave, it's, she's too far away to, to tell, which was a sort of parallel of a scene in Wolf's Mrs. Dalloway, exactly. where Clarissa sees a member of the royal family go by. And I, and I got to think, well, who What are the, the American royalty? Roy who's American royalty? <laughs> Movie stars. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. I love this moment. Yeah. And it, it was, it was I, when, when, the, when we were actually shooting the movie, I used to joke with Meryl about it. Like, if, if, if I'd known, all I have to do is put a movie star in the book and I actually get to meet the movie star, I would have put a lot more movie stars in a lot more books. <laughs> 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 the biggest surprise in the hours, the movie, was um, Nicole Kidman. Nobody thought of Nicole as a serious actor. She'd been in a Batman movie. Really Paramount, the studio that was Funding the movie said we need a big movie star. Meryl was in a little bit of a career dip at the time. Julianne Moore was not yet as famous as she is now, and Paramount said we want the glamorous and fabulous Nicole Kidman to play Virginia Woolf. And David, the writer, and um, Stephen Dolby, the director, and I all thought, well, what? Like Minnie Mouse wasn't available. <laughs> 
you know, forgive me. And I, and this is not, this is, I, Nicole knows about this. This, this is not a story I'm telling behind Nicole's back. Um, no one thought she could do it. It, it, was just, it was just her star power. And so it was all the more remarkable when she got to the set in London and I, I, I wasn't there the whole time, but I was there then. And um, you, know, you watch the dailies after the day shoot. And even from her first scenes, I remember sitting in the room with, with um, David and, and Stephen and other people and thinking, oh my God, is she really going to do it? And she did. Yes. But that was, that was kind of miraculous. And was it before Eyes Wide Shut or after? It was before Eyes Wide Shut. It was before she'd been in anything serious. She had, she had just divorced that, that short actor guy she'd been married to, Tom Cruise. Um, <laughs> also gay, right? We don't know what Tom um, Cruise is. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, I'm perfectly happy to say Tom Cruise is gay. Uh, I just don't know. Um, okay. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I um, Tom Cruise is probably gay. <laughs> this is a tangent. But whenever, whenever anyone asks me who my favorite gay writer is, I always say Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> but he's not, right? No, he probably was. No way. Biggest clo big, biggest closet case in American letters. Just for the record, <laughs> Ernest Hemingway. There, wow. Well, we we will never know. Right. But 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 rumors abound, and I feel like you kind of you, it kind of figures. Like anyone anyone that macho, like what's that about really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyone that masculine? I just, I just think he was a big queer. My favorite gay writer, Ernest Hemingway. I'm on the record with that. I don't know about Tom Cruise, but I feel confident that Ernest Hemingway is good. I just remember you mentioned in some interviews that you never expected to sell more than 2,000 copies of ours, I didn't. and simultaneously it became. Bestseller, like international. How many languages it is translated? Oh, into? like 50. Like it's crazy. Yes. Um, in retrospect, it makes sense, but at the time, you didn't look at this book about three women and think this is going to be a huge. This is going to make my career or be a huge bestseller. Nobody thought that. Um, even with the movie, um, no one thought the movie would be a hit. I was sitting with Scott Rudin, the producer, in his office, and. Um, we're looking at the poster, which they use, the three actors, um, and then you need a, you know, you need a little, you need a few words. Like, what is the movie actually about in four or five words? And you know, couldn't think and couldn't think. And, and um, Scott said, "I've got it. Three depressed lesbians. You do the math." <laughs> <laughs> Which is not, of course, what they used. But, but <laughs> that's indicative of people's expectations. No one thought anyone was going to want to see that. Mm -hmm. And if there is anything to be learned from that as a, as a writer, as an artist, as a filmmaker, as whatever you do, it's um, do what you want. Because you cannot know what's going to speak to people. So, okay. Pier 45, right? Pier 45, here we are. There was a time when this was just a derelict pier, half-rotted, and um, it's been reformed since then. I see, but, um, yeah. There are also a lot of um, transsexual hookers who came here. It was very... Um, oh, so it was here, because uh, I saw that uh, series, Pose, Yes, Pose. So this is exactly this, where it This is exactly happened. where it happened. Wow. Right here. I know, yeah, I know. Now it I doesn't know. look like and now that at all. And now, it's, and now it's people with dogs and people on bicycles. Yes. As it probably should be. You moved here 20... I've moved here about 25 years ago. Oh, yeah. 25 yeah. years ago. Yeah, and it's been a while. The Greenwich Village is right It's sort of in over front. The, like, yeah, huh? behind us, right there. Yeah. The gay neighborhood. Uh-huh. Now it's the rich neighborhood. Absolutely. And if you're gay and rich, you can still live here, but it's not so gay anymore. Right. It's not the, it's not the gay neighborhood anymore. And I frankly look forward to the day when there, when there are no gay neighborhoods, when every neighborhood is for everybody. Ten Years produced two terrible novels that no one will ever see. And what did you do for a living while uh, working on those novels? You know, I worked in bars. In bars? I was a really good bartender. Bartender? Yeah, I was an excellent bartender. It was terrific. Um, I would write during the day, 
and I, I have to write during the day. I have to start in the morning and spend the day writing. And I thought, well, what jobs could I do? You could be a night watchman. Yes. You could be a cat burglar. A cat burglar. <laughs> you could work in a bar. And that's what I did. For how years. many years? About seven or eight years. Until I just, and I liked it. I liked it. fun. It, it, was, it was very much not writing. It was not cerebral. It was immediate. It was, hey, here. Just drink, just drink, just drink, just drink. Mm -hmm. Bye, baby. Um, until one day, I just could not make one more margarita for one more drunk. Why? I just had had it. It's, it's, it's a weird, it's a funny thing. Uh, working in a bar, being sober, mostly sober, uh -huh. when everyone else is drunk. And at a certain point, I know a lot of former bartenders, now writers or doctors or whatever, who reach the same point where you just feel like, you know, I don't want to spend five nights a week among people who walk in as themselves and stumble out as some poor, sad drunk. I don't want to s keep seeing that over and over and over again. And what it was like, that life, back 25 years ago? It was fun. I don't know if it was more fun. This is, it's all, it, everything is always fun um, to somebody, but um, it's easy to romanticize it. I think a lot of us felt like, yeah, perverts, woo! Uh, <laughs> you know, I can only speak for myself and, yeah. and my friends, but um, no, your your um, your aunt Tilda in the Midwest might have thought you were some kind of sexual criminal. Um, the mayor probably did, but you didn't. You just felt like I'm just I'm just living my sexy life in the shadows here, right. and we were proud of we were, we were fine. I started writing during the AIDS epidemic, and most of my friends, whether they were sick or well, didn't have anything to read that was about their lives. And I thought somebody should write those books. Did you lose many friends? I did. I did. I did. I, um, I, I worked with ACT UP. Um, it was a terrible time. Of course, um, and the only, the only remotely good thing about it was seeing people come together like that. A lot of gay men, but not all gay men. Straight men were part of ACT UP. A lot of women were part of ACT UP, and it really people people rose up and 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 made a difference. And we did public dem we did public demonstrations. We we oh god! I mean, um, the first George Bush was giving a talk, the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, and this was well into his one and only term, and he had still not talked publicly about AIDS at all. And so a group of us, dressed as if we were guests at the Waldorf and got in the elevator and went up to an upper floor and covered ourselves in fake blood. In fake blood? Yeah. And came, took the elevator down and just walked into the room where George Bush was speaking and no one would touch us because they said, infected, go ahead, arrest me. Infected blood, go ahead. Wow. And we did things like that because no one was paying any attention to it. And we needed, we felt like we needed to bring public attention to the epidemic, which was getting no, there wasn't research about, there wasn't enough research about drugs, there was no help from politicians, there were no education programs. So you're driven to extremes. And you go to jail and get out. Did you go to the jail? I've been to jail so many times. Really? Tell yes. me about it. Oh, it's boring. It's so boring. Uh, for uh, going to the streets and protesting? Um, for what? Here, the law here is um, you're not really breaking a law, staging a public protest, but if a cop comes up to you and says you have to go out of the street and you say no, then you're resisting arrest. Then you're, then you, then you get handcuffed and taken to jail, which we always did. How many times? A, a dozen times. 
and you get processed, your fingerprints and all that. It, take, it takes about it takes about seven or eight hours to go to go through the whole thing. And then you, they just release you. Then, well, then you have a court date, and you show up for your court date, and um, most of the judges didn't feel like well, these are not exactly real criminals. These are citizens trying to make a difference and so they were fairly lenient with us. The general idea was promise not to do it for another six months and your record is cleared. But then we would do it again. ECOP was sort of powered by two factions. Um, there were the relatively rational people, I was one of those, mm -hmm. and there were the more extreme people who would say things at meetings like, you know, we can't just do these public demonstrations anymore. It's time to start kidnapping public officials. <laughs> Which you never did, right? Which, because there were, no, there were enough of us in the room was, to say, I, I really don't think I want to do 10 years for kidnapping. <laughs> <laughs> well, it gives you plenty of time for writing in jail. <laughs> um, we did make some differences. Not as many as we'd hoped to make, but the Centers for Disease Control speeded up the drug testing process. Some of that, some of that actually happened in part because we just insisted on it. Because as citizens, you do have a certain power. I have a, I have a whole criminal, I have a whole criminal record. I could never run, I could never run for president. <laughs> I think for me, the earlier novels were, at least in part, were in part meant to tell the stories of gay lives that nobody was telling. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to kind of put out there these untold stories about the lives of gay men and women, queers of all varieties. I've never wanted to be sort of pigeonholed as a gay writer, as if that, as if that made me a different kind of writer. But at the same time, if you are gay, you are a different kind of writer. You're also a different kind of writer if you're black, or if you're a woman, or if you're really anybody but a straight white man. What I hope to imply is, yes, my sexual orientation is an important part of who I am. It's not necessarily the most important part. It's not necessarily the first thing I would need you to know. As we were, if when we were meeting, I'm also American, white, privileged, male. The list goes on. And how would you define uh, in what way um, your sexual orientation influences uh, the way you write about life. Whoever you are in the world has an effect on the way you see the world. It actually affects the way the world shows itself to you. As a gay man, I live in a slightly different world. Little things. I have a woman friend, a poet, about my age, and we're very comfortable together and we look like a couple. And when we are out together, I call it straight like me in recognition <laughs> of, of an old book called Black Like Me about a, a white guy who, who put on makeup and looked convincingly black and lived as a black man. Uh, this is straight like me. People are friendlier. Mm -hmm. Train conductors, shop clerks. People are, are more like, hey, I, well, I think just because you're recognized, you, you look like somebody they recognize, you look like them. You're here, you're here with your wife, your age-appropriate, loving, well-dressed wife. I don't even, you know, homophobia, I don't know. It's more like recognizability. Um, uh, one of my best friends is a, a guy named Derek who is African-American and um, living in New York, doesn't experience overt racism, but he was just telling me that if he's in an elevator, he's a large, muscular, tattooed black man. If he's in an elevator 
and there is an, a white woman in the elevator, she always shifts her purse to the side away from him. It's like that. You know, uh -huh. it's a thousand little things. It's not. It's not that anyone is burning crosses on your on your in, in New York anyway. That anyone is burning crosses on your front lawn. It's not that any. It's not that anyone is writing scrawling the N word on your apartment door. It's it's that sales clerks treat you differently. It's that women move their bags to the side away, facing away from you. It's a billion little things that you notice. I don't like the word tolerance. Why? Nobody has to tolerate us. <laughs> they have to treat us with respect. I don't need your tolerance. You know what I mean? I don't need you to tolerate my difference. Right. I need you to embrace my difference as I embrace your difference. I forgive you for being straight. You fucking, you fucking <laughs> forgive me for being gay. You know what I mean? <laughs> The Home at the End of the World. To me, it's a book about like three people uh, trying to love each other. They're always yeah. trying to like split into a couple and somebody outside and then trying to uh, be mm, together again. And uh, eventually, spoiler, they right, don't right. succeed. <laughs> they don't succeed, yeah, right. Do you, you think, have, have, so my listeners, they don't succeed. <laughs> So my question is, basically, why they do not succeed? Is it because the story happened like 30 years ago when, uh, like, Paul Amor's um, uh, relationship was something really exotic and mm -hmm. they were, like, first mm -hmm. generation of people who tried to live like that? It's been my experience that threesomes are still difficult. Tell me about your experience. <laughs> <laughs> That's for another time. Um, Why? You know? No, I don't know. No, I'm not being coy. It's not my personal experience. I but see. but I have friends who have... Uh, I, I think often um, it's hard enough to be with one person. Though, well, I don't know. I, don't get me started on this, because I, I, I do know a threesome who are doing great. It's been five years. I don't think of Home at the End of the World as being exactly about the odds on working it out as a threesome. Um, in my mind, when I started writing it, it was about two men who've known each other since they were children, and they're in love, except one of them isn't gay. What do you do about that? So they kind of bring a woman in as an intermediary, as someone for them both to love, and it doesn't work out because of who those people are. I mean, I think finally, in a novel, you're, you're always writing about particular characters. A Home at the End of the World is not at all intended as a commentary on three-way relationships. It's the story of two doomed lovers who try to make it work by, by b both falling in love with a woman. So he can, the, so one, the straight guy can have sex with her and then the gay guy can go shopping with her. <laughs> I, I, th I think maybe what's, what's most true as I think about my various characters is that um, their sexuality is complicated. Their sexuality is their own. Most of my characters, it wouldn't feel entirely adequate to say gay, straight, exactly. bi. That they have, their own, they have their own sexualities. Clarissa in the hours is... A lesbian, she lives with a woman, but she's still in love with a man. Since when you are uh, open gay? You mentioned in your interviews previously that you were always being uh, open gay, but um, uh, when exactly this always starts? Oh, oh yeah, not, not always since I was two. But, <laughs> <laughs> I came out to my parents when I was in college. You know, so life is full of surprises. I kind of thought, well, hey, let's just acknowledge what we we've known for a long time, thinking, well, yeah, that would be no big deal. And it was a big deal. Uh, they were surprised. <laughs> really? <laughs> really you're surprised? Um, they were surprised and upset. And, um, and I was angry with them at first. Not just saying, sure, great, you're, you're our son, whatever. They didn't do that. And what did they do? What um, did they say? They said, we can't really accept this. Do you feel you need psychological 
counseling. It was not the reaction I expected from them. And I really had to finally step back and say to myself, well, if it took me a certain amount of time to come to terms with my sexuality, I guess I have to give them a certain amount of time. And they're, they're no, they have both died. Um, not because I was gay. <laughs> <laughs> There's no connection. <laughs> not right after you came out. I didn't, I didn't kill them by coming out. <laughs> okay. You are kind of the same age of uh, gay rights movement in uh, the U.S. Cause yes, you... yes. Yeah, I'm very, I'm enormously old. Yes. No, it's not. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's the I'm, I'm in my 60s. Yeah. Yeah. And you were uh, um, studying in Stanford in California yep. Yep. while Harvey Milk was there doing his career. Yes, yes. And yes. you came here right after, the, several years after the Stonewall. It would, it was, let's see, Stonewall was like 69. 69, so I wasn't yes. really, I was, I was, I was, I was post Stonewall. You were Stonewall. like 17 at the time. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I was, I was in high school for Stonewall. Yeah. I, I was, I, I, I was, I was, I had a, I had a girlfriend. When the, when the when the when the hero of the Stonewall were riding, were riding. Wow. I was in Pasadena making out with a girl. I said I was bisexual. Yes. For a while, had another girlfriend in college. She was right. great. She was great. She was actually so great. Tell me about her. Her name was Janet. I loved her. I did love her. It wasn't it wasn't just me trying to look straight by by having a girlfriend. She was fantastic. And um, we got married. You got. We Officially I married. I don't tell a lot of people about this. Whoa! Our senior year, we were just we were we had a few drinks. We were in bed, and I guess it was I must have said, "Why don't we go to Las Vegas and get married?" She Crazy. Said, sure. She was that kind of girl. And <laughs> like one, two, three. One, two, three. We got we got in my car. We drove to Las Vegas. We really wanted to be married by an Elvis Presley impersonator. We couldn't find one. <laughs> And it yeah. wasn't until after that, we're about to graduate from college, that she said, I think you should explore this thing with men. So and she let me came know if you still want idea. to be married in six months. Call me. And I did. And I said, I love you, but I don't think I should be your husband. And we got a divorce. Then there was a there's a sort of second coming out if you have any kind of public life. Exactly. So that happened when that happened um, fairly early on. I was on a radio talk show on National Public Radio. Uh, NPR. All Things Considered is the name of the, of the, of the show. And it, it, it's, it's, it's got a wide, it's widely listened to. And it was my first novel, A Home at the End of the World. Terry didn't really want to talk about the book. She wanted to talk about being gay. She wanted to talk about my life as a gay man, as a gay writer, gay, 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 gay. And I thought, you know, this was, um, it was long enough ago that the AIDS epidemic was still primarily centered among gay men. Of course. It was probably during either the year, the presidencies of, of Reagan or the first George Bush, neither of whom ever even mentioned the word AIDS in public. And sitting there talking to Terry Gross for National Public Radio about being gay, I thought, you know, my experience of my sexual orientation is complicated. And like I said, not only is gay not the first thing to know about me, I'm not uninterested in women, um, but at the time I thought, you know, if I am at all equivocal about my sexuality. I'm a, I, I don't want anyone listening to this to think that, that I feel like I have something to hide. So I basically said, yeah, Terry, you know, gay, 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 gay is the most important thing about me. Gay is everything, gay is my life. I, I, I get up in the gay morning, I brush my gay teeth with gay toothpaste. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Nothing could matter more than the fact that I am a homosexual. 
<laughs> and when they come to take the homosexuals away, I'm going first. <laughs> because it felt politically necessary at the mm -hmm. time, you know? And how was that accepted by um, the audience? Uh, the audience what seemed okay reaction? with it. My, my parents, <laughs> we're talking about coming out to my parents. Um, <clears throat> my parents were troubled by it because their, their feeling was, well, okay, now you had to come out to everybody. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't it enough to just tell us. Now you had to tell, like, like, you know, the people of Des Moines, Iowa. And I said, yeah, I did. I did. And, um, and they said, we feel like we failed. We did something wrong, the, and that is how you turned out gay. And I said, what if you did something right? What if you raised me in a way that it makes it possible for me to be openly gay, to go on the radio and tell anybody who's listening that I'm gay? What if that was a success story for you? Didn't buy it. Didn't. <laughs> wow. But I did. But it took some time for them to buy it finally, eventually. Yeah, but I still, I still believe it, and they, they came around to it too. That, 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 that. I don't know how many parents are homophobic anymore. How many parents are upset if their child is 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 queer? But I feel like, oh, oh, you know, if you have raised a child who is able to live openly as him or herself, congratulate yourselves. I think it's better if you are out. Why? To everybody, because that's, I think, really the main reason that, that gay rights have advanced the way they are, because your mother knows you're gay, and your father knows you're gay, and your boss knows you're gay. And that's where the real, that's where the real revolution takes place, as people begin to know that Everybody knows somebody who's gay. And they're not a danger to you. They're not even that different from you. They don't eat your children? They don't eat, well, some of us eat children, but no, no, no. <laughs> I don't want to rule that out. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's, that's what works. That's, and, and it, in a sense, it's not quite this, but in a sense, it's all we have to do, or it's the it's the thing that's right in front of us. Tell your boss, tell your parents, tell everybody that you're gay, and it may not go well. Yeah, be ready to be fired. Be ready to be fired. Be ready for your parents to stop taking your calls. So what's the point then? If you are fired, you are parents stop uh, taking your calls you are the price is too big no? I I would I would argue that the greater price is living a life of secrecy and lies and I, I who wants to be fired from a job but but do you really want a job that requires you to act like someone other than you are should you have that job what's that doing to you as a person What is it doing to you as a person going to see your parents with some girl who they think is your girlfriend? Is that, that, what kind of relationship is that? And I think it's worth taking the chance. You got a family. You I do. A husband, I have a and husband a and, a, and a grown son. Yes, yes, who actually called me during the interview <laughs> about an apartment he wants to rent. Yeah. How old is uh, your son? He's 22. He just graduated from college. Um, he, he's taking a year or two before graduate school and has a job as an assistant with a design company. He doesn't really want to be a designer, but he just got offered this job. He's very capable. He's very good at, at any number of things. and. Um, He's very idealistic. I mean, ultimately, he wants to do human international humanitarian work. Uh, do you play football? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, we have a is it yours? We have no, no. We have a foster child um, who is 22. There has. Uh -huh. um, we're staying here for a while. I see. Well, um, 
but do you do some sports uh, and did you do it in, you know, in college? You know, I, um, I run, I, I do yoga. I don't know if we call those sports. Yeah. I don't, but yeah, but you know, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't play. I, what is... This is, what, <laughs> this, this, is, this is my kid. And I don't know what we did wrong. But he turned out heterosexual. <laughs> he leaves this or this kind of thing around. Can you believe it? <laughs> oh no, it's horrible. <laughs> but back in college, what was your favorite? He has no fashion sense. What? what how no, did he fail? Stop I know. It. I know. I know. It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> what did we do wrong? Your uh, Snow Queen book, uh, yeah. the president election, and he says like, "You gonna reelect the worst president of the United States." who was like George W. Bush. Right, 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 right. At the time, it didn't seem it could be worse than George W. Bush. And guess what? Guess what? Never, never imagine you've hit bottom. <laughs> I think Trump is a disgrace and a criminal. I, I, I think it's unconscionable to try to close the borders to people who, to refugees. Um, I, 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 I think it is verges on genocide. But now you have a new candidate, uh, Mayor Pete Buttig Buttigieg. Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Buttigieg. Yeah. Who is gay, married. His husband uh, is responsible for his uh, PR, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think about him? I, I think he's great. I, I think he is incredibly smart and compassionate. Um, I, he doesn't feel like an especially serious candidate for 2020 at this point. I mean, who knows? I think he's great. I think what's not to like about the first openly gay, serious candidate for president. And I think part of what's especially interesting to me about Mayor Pete as a candidate is I think if he were straight, he'd be too perfect. <laughs> so his gayness is kind of his weakness, you mean? I, no, I think it's part of his appeal. I mean, I, 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 think, I think that people get to feel liberal about somebody who went to Harvard, fought in Afghanistan, is in a stable marriage, but always oh, gay, which some, you know, like, like, like Americans, look at who we elect. We don't like, as a people, we don't like too anyone perfect. who's too smart, too good. You know what I'm saying? That I, I actually think perversely enough, um, not only Buttigieg is sexuality but the way he has handled it is proving to be one of his strengths is one of the reasons people are voting for him.